Jonathan Billy. There's Bill and Paula. Hello. Hey, how are you, Steve? Nice to see you. Nice to see you. I can't to get out there. I'm going to be in San Francisco pretty soon. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. We're uh, just waiting for a couple of minutes for everyone to join. Okay. What do I do with all this thing? Just hang on. I'm going to find this. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, Irene. Hello, welcome, everyone. There we go. Okay. Beautiful. Yeah. Let's give everybody a few moments to settle in. Okay, audience is joining. Okay. Hello, hi everyone. Okay. Let me get started with uh, some introductions while uh, everybody settles in here. Thank you for joining us. Welcome. This is the fifth in a series of nine lectures uh, prepared by T-Space within the framework of the uh, residency program. I'm Irini Safrelia. I'm a practicing architect and educator in New York. I'm currently running the residency program for T-Space together with Stephen Hall and a beautiful team. Thank you, Marisa, Esther, our coordinator, and Yasmina Parto, who's here with us, our co-host, also an architect practicing with Stephen Hall Architects. For those who don't know, uh, the Stephen Myron Hall Foundation uh, and is a, the Peace Space is an initiative of the Stephen Myron Hall Foundation, and it focuses on the coming together of art, education, design, and ecology, and its programming really supports uh, the, the meeting of the arts, poetry, and music, and art, and architecture. And uh, in addition to the Peace Space uh, program, uh, Peace Space produces the synthesis of the art event, Every summer, there are two events in art right and one in architecture, so which is coming up uh, on July 17th with Arlene Shehet, the work called Couple Off. And you can find in our uh, uh, chat some links on how to register for those events. And on September 4th, we have pamphlet architecture exhibit. Uh, and we're excited about that show. Um, also, you can register for this uh, and find out more information on the chat. For our lecture today, you've joined William Stout, The Influences of Books. Uh, Bill, uh, thank you for being here. I'm very excited about this lecture. Um, and uh, our resident will uh, introduce you shortly. I just wanted to welcome on the panel our six residents, Stephen, Jingwen, Lafina, Isabella, Teresa and Yahya, uh, who will be uh, moderating uh, the conversation today. Uh, one quick note about our scholarship program, uh, which I'm very happy about. The program is growing, and all our residents are, are very generously supported by donors. Uh, so the Cinnamon Scholarship, the Pulley Moon Scholarship, KM, JM Kaplan Fund, the Carpillero Scholarship, Al Help Scholarship, 100 Mile and also generous support by Elise Jack, Jeffrey Brown, and Stan Allen. Thank you very much for your support, making this possible, not only for our residents, but for the broader audience who um, contributes and, and uh, has access to those resources uh, that are made available through the residency program. And in the chat, you can find information how you can make a contribution in very simple means. Um, back to the theme for 2022, our residency theme, Cosmic Dust, Space and Time, and uh, our residents experimenting with forms and ideas, uh, producing thought experiments, their works are underway, heading to our mid-review next week. I will pass it on to Yasmina to very briefly talk about the structure of the webinar, familiarize yourself with uh, the environment, and introduce Bill before we can uh, give you the full Lord, in a moment. Thank you so much. Thank you, Greta. Thank, Thank you, Irene. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you again for joining us today. I will quickly go through the structure of the webinar. The presentation is going to be about 30 to 40 minutes, presented by William Staff. Thank you, William, again for accepting our invitation. 
It is truly a pleasure uh, having you here. We will have uh, about 15 minutes of Q&A led uh, by our panelists and audience. Please feel free to yeah. use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, as well as the chat function to ask your questions. The questions will be answered at the end of the presentation, but I still encourage you to ask your questions throughout the duration of the lecture. You do not have to wait until the end. And as uh, Irene mentioned, we will be populating the chat with relevant information throughout the lecture as well. Please make sure to check those out. And without further ado, I would like to welcome one of our residents, Theresa Mark, to introduce our speaker, William Stout. The floor is yours, Theresa, and looking forward to your presentation. How do I get it on slideshow? Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Teresa Mark, and it's my pleasure to introduce William Stout to the T-Space Rhinebeck and Stephen Myron Hall Foundation Architecture Lecture Series. William Stout founded William Stout Architectural Books in 1974. The origins of the bookstore date back to when Stout was a practicing architect and would go to Europe and bring back hard to find architectural books. His colleagues and friends would ask him to bring them back additional copies and thus the shop was born. About 10 years ago, he started William Stout Publishers, which puts out a few books a year, mainly on architecture and landscape in the Bay Area, but also including books on architectural theory and reprints of important out of print titles. Thank you, William, for joining us today and sharing your lecture, The Influence of Books. Well, I'm gonna to talk today a little about uh, uh, the bookstore. Uh, and uh, I have images of uh, from books and also images of books that I've done as a publisher. And uh, then I have some images of uh, books I should have done probably and didn't have time to do. I have quit publishing about, I quit publishing about uh, five or six years ago. Uh, my bookstore is oriented, it's in San Francisco. It's oriented around uh, architectural monographs, books on individual architects or um, offices. Uh, it has a history and theory section. That section includes uh, books similar to Bannister Fletcher, uh, Spiro Kostoff, Kenneth Rampton, uh, and other historians who have written, and it's a kind of a catch-all collection. We have technical and materials, and we also have a very good industrial design section. Uh, it just so happens that a lot of architects also do industrial design uh, and are covered in the industrial design section and also in the architectural monograph section. A good example of that would be Gio Ponte or Steven uh, in terms of uh, covering both areas. We have a photographic section. Uh, the photographic section also includes uh, architectural photography, which is fairly, very important. And uh, we have a very large urban design and uh, landscape section and uh, an important drawing section. A lot of it deals with hand drawings as opposed to drawings on the computer because that's uh, another art. Um, the art, art monographs uh, and art history monographs are also important because we, uh, we have a very large collection that I've collected over the years. I'm going to start out this talk with these two slides. Uh, and um, these images are from a book uh, done by Bernard Rudofsky, and it was called Architects Without Architects. On the left, we have Canyon de Chez, and on the right, churches in Ethiopia called La, La, La Labella. Uh, Rudofsky traveled around doing uh, photographing buildings not done by architects, and then uh, in the 60s did a show at the Museum of Modern Art called Architects Without Architects, and a book was done uh, with that title. Uh, it's a it's a very good book, uh, and it uh, it is still in print. As you can see, both of these slides show architecture inserts in a different way. The Canyon de Chez uh, opening in this huge canyon is a uh, is an Indian dwelling done uh, in four corners 
New Mexico. The building on the right in Ethiopia, and it's an insertion into that opening. The building on the right is actually a piece of granite, uh, a whole granite ledge that they cut these churches into the granite and then have <clears throat> uh, steps down to the churches and also have tunnels linking the, ch the churches together. Now I'm going to be doing this by hand. So, uh, okay. Well, let's see. Okay. This set of slides is done by another architect who traveled around the world and ended up doing um, a book of each area that he thought was significant. This particular set of slides is of granaries done in Upper Portugal. The book was done by Norman Carver, and this one is this particular book is, is called Iberian Villages. He did about 10 or 15 books on different places that he traveled, Italy, Spain, Rome, and different, different areas of the world. And the books are really well done and actually act as a, as a guidebook. The, the problem with this particular set of books is that they were done by the architect and they're all out of print at this point. So you would have to find these books in an out of print bookstore. This is taking quite a while. Uh, this is a little background of who I am. Uh, I grew up in going to school in Idaho. I went to the University of Idaho in architecture school and then the University of California in a master's degree program. These two images, one is on the left is a table rock above the Snake River in Idaho. The Snake River starts in Yellowstone and ends up in Washington, Idaho, and Oregon, and, and dumps into the Columbia River. A building, there weren't too many buildings in Idaho that were significant, but one of the buildings types that I liked was these wood burners that burned sawdust in um, lumber mills after the, uh, after the uh, sawdust was collected. Um, that actually ended at some point in time because they started using all the sawdust to make uh, chipboard and uh, plywood and so on. Let's see if I can get this going. This is pretty slow, I'm sorry. Um, this, is, this is a set of slides that shows you what happens when the sawdust is, well, this is the where the Snake River hits the Columbia River there is, you're in Idaho, Oregon, and Washington. And this is a bridge linking the two. And you can see that what we have are logs and sawdust being put into containers to go to Japan to make different wood products for them. And then this is an alfalfa, alfalfa field in, in Idaho. So these are some of the images um, of my early background. I'm just trying to set this up there. The, my, uh, this, is, this is going to give you, I'm sorry this is so slow. I don't know what, what is happening. <clears throat> okay, this is, uh, my second bookstore was on Osgood Alley. And this is a shot through the two buildings from the bookstore looking at the Transamerica building. This is a typical day in San Francisco and it's like that today here. The mornings are often filled with fog and this is the Transamerica building in fog. This is an early photograph of Stephen Hall. This is probably circa 1976. Uh, you see, he was actually, he was actually, um, doing some sand drawings in this particular, at this particular day. The book, the bookstore on Osgood also had one of Stephen's early exhibitions. This was uh, probably done, I don't know the exact year, but, but he did a set of drawings in pencil in New York. And he also had this 
uh, competition model that he did for the for the uh, Minnesota State Capitol building, which he did with several people here in San Francisco. So this is the model. This is this is a kind of an archival photograph because, as you can see, we were putting up the exhibition. This is then the model of uh, the model of the Capitol building with the drawing of the Capitol building and the uh, one of the drawings that he did of the bridge. Mm -hmm. Why? I'm sorry. This is okay. That's it there. Boy, oh boy. I don't know how I can hit this any other way. Sorry about the. Um, uh, let me. This is frustrating. This then is the other side of that exhibition. And uh, so you can see the bookstore was a small bookstore, but we had a lot of different. Uh, a lot of different magazines, books, and so on for the architectural community. Um, we we actually this is uh, Putagawa's GA books, which are which I was one of the first people to actually carry that those magazines. That includes his GA houses and and many of the books that uh, Futagawa did. One of the great architectural photographers. One of my interests is basically when I go to new cities or uh, uh, when I wanna find a place to go someplace that's quiet, I usually, I study, the, I study the cemeteries of the city to find out a little more about the culture of the city and who live there. It's a great way to study a portion of the city. I like this, uh, this quote by Balzac. It says, this is Père Lachaise in Paris. It says, I seldom go out, but when I feel myself flogging, I go and cheer myself up at Père Lachaise. While seeking out the dead, I see nothing but the living. This then is a, this is an Idaho um, memorial marker, simply done out of just a pipe from the hardware store. These are this is an interesting marker, also uh, in that same area. Uh, it's. It's a nice rock and two gravestones, memorial or memorial um, uh, wood wood pieces that are painted white up off the ground and carved in. The, the names are actually carved into the wood paint. Oh, no, wait a minute. These are. Uh, I practiced architecture for about 20 years and also started the bookstore when I was practicing architecture. This is a small housing project I did in Bernal Heights in San Francisco. Uh, this is a project that my wife Pauletta and I did for the uh, Jewish Museum in San Francisco. It was an entry, chapel, and meeting rooms for the cemetery. Uh, it never got financed, so we never actually built that project. And then when I moved to 804 Montgomery Street, I actually had an office in the basement. And this bottom photo shows the office in the basement. Two of my two, two people I've really admired over the years are one, George Wittenborn, a bookseller in New York, and Louis Sullivan. George Wittenborn um, was from Germany and came to New York to sell books. He had a great book background. And he had a he had a gallery on Madison Avenue. And it was a place for for the local architects and artists to meet. He had wonderful European books. He was one of the first to have such a quality bookstore in, in the United States. I use Lewis Sullivan as a model because he actually when he he actually did a lot of work um, in San or in uh, Chicago, and um, was also very re respective of young people there. And Frank Lloyd Wright was one of the apprentices in his office. Sullivan also was kind of the inventor of the high rise building as we know it today. Uh, 
All right, but I, geez, I just don't understand what the hell is going on. Okay. Now, this is frustrating. Okay. Um, sorry, I wish I, I don't know what this computer. Okay. I'm basically, I'm basically a collector. Uh, I love to collect things. Um, I, that's one of the reasons I, I, I started a bookstore as I, in, with the bookstore in mind, I could also have a wonderful library. So over the years, I have a wonderful art library and a wonderful architectural library. These are some photographs of other people that collect. This is a bicycle museum in Amsterdam. And then this is uh, Soane's Museum in London, where Soane, in his own house, had all of these architectural objects that he had collected throughout the year, throughout all of his career. And this is an artist's interpretation of a collage of a library. I'm going to, oh, wait a minute. Jeez, damn it. Okay. I'm going to talk a little about some of the books I've done in my publishing company when I when it was running. This is a book we did of Eero Saarinen. Um, Eero Saarinen's office was in uh, in Michigan. And there was a young man there named Richard Wright, or yeah, Richard Knight, and he was actually the office boy. And when the when the photographer the, for the office left, he became the photographer. And he came to me, in about fifteen years ago, with seventy rolls of film that he had collected from the Saarinen office, and wanted to make a book. So we took that film, and then made this book. Uh, it's a history of an of the Saarinen office in one of the most important uh, periods of his work. As you can see, the we have photo we have photographs in the book of um, TWA details of details of it. And then we what what's really beautiful and interesting of the book. If you look down to the rest, you can see Arrow looking at the details of a model that they built. They built huge models. So um, when they did Dulles Airport, they basically had a model that they could actually put up in a field and actually made a periscope so they could figure out how the building would look when the airplanes came in. One of the, one of the more interesting books we did is with Marianne Ray and Robert Mongarian. They had a commission to study the entry of the Jurassic Museum, of uh, the Museum of Jurassic Technology in Burbank. And it never, it never really came to, to, to fruition because they ran out of money. But uh, anyone who knows both of these architects realized that they had done a lot of drawings. And we took the drawings and then made a book out of, out of uh, their drawings. It was really a uh, it was is a, a work of love from them. And if you ever have a chance to go to Burbank, do drop by and uh, see this museum. It's a, it's a museum, a fantasy museum of natural history. He actually, it's like walking through a series of novels. This is a book we did uh, on Aaron Siskin, the great photographer. Aaron Siskin was asked to come to Chicago and teach with Maholi Naj at the Institute of Design. And this is, uh, and we did a book on the 50th anniversary of an exhibition of, uh, of the Design Museum. This is Aaron Siskin here in the photograph and he's photographing uh, a Sullivan building. And then this is Richard Nichols in the back, one of his students. This is actually the auditorium building that uh, is one of his photographs. The interesting thing with Richard Nichols is he ended up being a photographer, a professional photographer, and was very interested in documenting uh, and trying to save Sullivan's buildings as they were tearing them down. So he was photographing, he was photographing um, the stock exchange building and, and actually fell and, and died photo documenting these buildings. And there are about four books that he did um, on this documentation. A very, very interesting dialogue. This then is the photograph that uh, Richard Nichols took of the, uh, or uh, of uh, Aaron Siskin took of the Wainwright building. And what's interesting about it, I believe, is 
is you can place the you can place the uh, the automobiles with the time area time area. I did a book on William Turnbull um, at the end of his career. This um, this book also includes the the drawing of the, of the Heinz House and the photographs of the Heinz House and the photo and the drawing on the right is uh, the housing he did for the workers in Sea Ranch. This house is extremely interesting. Uh, it's a house broken with a, a house with a spline broken down the middle that you could walk through with the guest house on the left and the main house on the right. And it's really a, a beautiful example of how to do a building and fit it into the landscape. This is the house as it runs down the hill here. And then this is the house as you enter it and the, you park your car here if you want to park the car there. This is then, um, he, William Turnbull was a partner in MLTW. MLTW was one of the main architects of Sea Ranch. And this is the condominium they did in the 60s. And then this is the courtyard of Sea Ranch. I did a book with Jill Stoner called uh, Poems for Architects. It was a series of uh, 50 poems that she put together. Uh, Jill taught at the University of California, Berkeley, an architectural class. And one of her first uh, problems for the students was to give them a poem and then to do a building of that particular poem with their ideas about it. Uh, this, it's a it's a really beautiful book. Uh, we were we bought the rights to use Cortez's photographs from his book called On Reading. So each chapter of the book actually has one of his great photographs on a piece of vellum. And then for each of the uh, for each of the chapter headings, Jill did these wonderful drawings of villanelles, which is a poetic uh, type. And she explains that type in the book. It's really, a, it's really a beautiful book. I'd like to mention at this time that as a student uh, starting your library and, and collecting books, oftentimes what happens is that some of these wonderful books done by architects or, on or, or publishers on architects are very short runs. And you have a very limited time to buy, this, to buy the book. So if you have a chance to do it when they're, when they're actually being published, it's, um, it's, it's going to benefit you in the long run. At this point in time, you can't find this book on poetry. Uh, let's see here. Okay. Sorry, I don't know why. Okay, this is this is, <laughs> this is like a really old hand. I wish I was a little better technology from a technology standpoint. I don't know why it's taking so long. Get this up. Oh. Maybe there's another way to do this. I have no idea why. Okay, well, I better go back one because this is important. I I also did a book with Stephen, and uh, for some reason it doesn't want to show the slide. But we did a book called Horizontal Skyscraper, which, which is Stephen's project for the Vanke Development Company in Shenzhen, China. It's a it's a building that he laid flat on the ground, um, and he used the building, uh, he put it on pedestals so you could use the land under the building um, for walking through in a park and so on. It's really a beautiful building, and uh, it's in uh, one of the uh, really interesting areas of Shenzhen. I don't know if you know Shenzhen or China at all, but Shenzhen was one of the first cities that was developed when they opened up China. So a lot of the businesses from Hong Kong were went to China and I did a lot of publishing there. Uh, most of the printers in, in, uh, in uh, China ended up, uh, or in, in uh, Hong Kong ended up going to Shenzhen to work. This is a book I did on Donald Olson. He was a professor at the University of California. Um, very, very good architect. Um, 
I show this because it kind of shows drawings of that period. This is a wonderful rendering di he did of a house in Berkeley. And this is one of his great houses at Upper Campus in Berkeley. And then this is one of his early drawings of a shopping center he did for Richmond, which you can see is pretty, um, pretty straightforward, but he tried to use graphics and color to make it interesting. It's a, it was a very nice book and uh, I'm really pleased with the results. I'm gonna show you one of, one of the one of the books in my collection I really like is um, this book. Uh, it's a magazine called Camera. It's a Swiss Swiss magazine that I don't know if it still exists, but there's a, a section of this particular issue on what they call footprints. And uh, in the in the 50s and 60s, there was an Argentine architect named uh, Eduardo Sacrist. And he had been teaching architecture uh, in Argentina for years and realized that most of the books on architecture, all the plans were at different scales. So he decided with his students to actually come in and redraw most of the, most of the important buildings that are in history books. And he drew those and did a portfolio. That particular one is called Footprints. Um, it's in this magazine. And so what Camera Magazine did was they took the, the idea of the book and they photographed different buildings and uh, then uh, put the plans on Mylar over the buildings and showed how uh, this, his ideas work. This is the Pantheon in Rome, a photo on the left and a photograph or a plan on vellum over the uh, over the building photograph. This is the Brunelleschi's Duomo in Florence and Ramchamp. This then shows this, what he was doing. This shows actually photographs of the building with the plans overlaid onto the photograph of the building. And you can see the scale of Ramchamp up against the Duomo. So when he put this together, it was a very interesting idea that no one had really, that I don't think anyone had really developed before. So what had happened was the, the architecture schools in America were really spread out all over. One of the better schools at the time was North Carolina State. And North Carolina State um, director decided to have Secrese come to North Carolina and he taught there for years, and then that became one of the ways that they that a lot of the students um, learned history. They would be drawing these buildings up in the history course. And at the time, Sa uh, Saul Werman was working down there, and when Saul Werman was teaching, he actually took and also taught a class there. They took and uh, did sand models of, of cities all at the same scale, which is also a, a, a very beautiful book. These are some books from my collection. Um, I happen to get a collect. I happen to get a collection from a professor from the University of Oregon, and he was uh, had quite a few German books. Uh, in that collection was uh, uh, several books on Bruno Taut, the great German architect uh, of the teens and twenties in Berlin. And in that book, in in that collection was. Um, uh, a book on Alpine architecture, the great book that he did on Alpine architecture, which is the study of uh, utopian uh, drawings uh, using different kind of materials in in very artistic manner. And uh, that book is extremely rare. And, and um, I was able to get that copy. And I also got a copy of he and Eric Mendelssohn were also practicing in Berlin at the time, and they did houses. This is a uh, this is actually Bruno Taut's book on Bruno Taut's house, and uh, it was uh, you have two expressionistic architects. You have uh, Eric Mendelssohn and you have Bruno Taut, and their houses were very very different. In the Bruno Taut house, he actually he actually has photographs in the book of people in the building, and then at the end of the book. Well, in the book, he has every room has different colors in it. So at the end of the book, he then has a color chart 
that we see, and you can use, see those colors in relation to how he used them in the building. Uh, he also did a, an, a very important book at that time on modern architecture. This then, uh, at, at that time, let's say the, the teens and 20, teens to 30s, uh, 19 teens and 30s, uh, photography was just coming of age. So the, when architects traveled, uh, black and white photography became very, very, very common. So these books, this is a book that I have three sets of this um, uh, German book where this is a book on El Lazisky's uh, photographs of Russia. This is a, a book on Neutra, Richard Neutra, on America, on his trip to America. And then this is a book done by Gersberger on industrial buildings. This then is the dust jacket of Neutra's book, and this is the actual book. Now, at that particular time, Eric Mendelssohn um, came to the United States and he did a book on America. And that book is uh, of photographs of the of United States and Canada and had a lot of industrial buildings, especially granaries out of Canada and so on. And then Eric Mendelssohn also did a book on Russia, U USA and, and um, America. This then is a, a book on Eric Mendelssohn's house, which is also done in 1929. And uh, then this is the uh, uh, the photo of the book, but it's a little different in Eric Mendelssohn as opposed to Bruno Taut. Now, both of these are expressionistic architects, is that Eric Mendelssohn was very formal in his attitude toward photographing the buildings. And so there were no, no, uh, absolutely no people in them where Bruno Taut had people and, um, and details. This is also one of the first books on Adolf Loos there, done by Verlo, uh, Werner Verlag. One of the books in my collection I really like is uh, this portfolio. Oh boy. This portfolio by Eileen Gray, it's called E1027. It's her house in the South of France. And um, I bring this up as, a, as an interesting, th these type of portfolios were used because you could take them apart and use them and lie in flat in your architectural uh, desk or whatever. Now, what you'll see with this is that Eileen Gray and, and, and the publisher did all of these photographs and they were done in black and white. So their color photography hadn't been developed at that point. So what happens is they came back and actually then put used pochoir to actually put uh, color on these on the on the uh, the uh, photographs, so you can see. And pochoir is like a heavy tempera paint. It's it's really uh, uh, very dense. So you can see her her studies for rugs here, where somebody applies the pochoir. I don't think Eileen Gray actually did it. And then this is a room, a bedroom she did in the house with pochoir. These are the drawings that she did for the bedroom and the furniture and also the details. And then this is a whole room that she did in color. And then this is the plan. An interesting point with this is Corbusier's cabin was very close to this. Corbusier one summer went in and painted a drawing on the house and it really upset Eileen Gray quite a bit. I don't know if, I think maybe the, the painting was actually um, taken out of the house by her. Let's see. This is, um, this they say is maybe one of the most important books on modern architecture in America. It was done by the German publisher, Vosmuth, it's the double set portfolio that we call the Vosmuth on Frank Lloyd Wright. It's two volumes of 100 drawings. I actually have some of the drawings behind me. It, it took him very uh, uh, many years to do. Uh, I think he started the project in 1905. It was finished in 1910. Many of the delineators and um, of the project became very famous architects. Uh, during that period, Walter 
uh, Burley Griffin and his wife, Mary Mahoney Griffin, worked in the studio. And many of the drawings, like on the right-hand corner, were done by Marion Mahoney Griffin. Now, I show the... Uh, I show the building on the left because I think this is one of his more one of his more successful buildings. It's a complete city block in Mason City, Iowa. Mason City, Iowa was really the main city for providing bricks to, for Chicago. So it was a small little town, maybe a, ah, two thousand at the most. And it had a lot of money and it hired a lot of good architects to work there. And this is one of Frank Lloyd Wright's, I think, more important buildings. And it includes a bank, a hotel, and a retail space. The buildings on the right are in Montana. Uh, it's for a developer out of Chicago that, had, that owned a railroad and he developed this in Montana. Uh, some of the buildings are still there, but what I like about it is that uh, it uh, you see the rendering and you can see the different rendering styles. And what what Wright would do occasionally is is a lot of the a lot of people working in the office would put initials on each drawing they were working on, and in that manner, and in that manner, he would come in the next morning and erase any of the information that they may have put down about the ownership of the of the drawing. So. We uh, we really don't know who did all the drawings, but there's been studies about um, the the particular artist. One of one of the more interesting books I have is a book of watercolors of Oscar Schlemmer. Oscar Schlemmer was uh, a Bauhaus teacher and an artist. Uh, he drew stage sets and he also did an opera, and you can see that he was really uh, very very into color and also physical mannequins. So he did a, a ballet opera. And these are some of the drawings he did um, for the costumes, you can see. And most of, most of the mannequins that were mocked up for this are in uh, the Stuttgart Museum of Art. This is, uh, this is the Bruno Taut book. Oh boy. This is the Bruno Taut book on Alpine architecture. And what was happening in the First World War is a lot of these architects didn't have any work and they were basically in the army or they were uh, in the war. And they did these fantasy drawings. This is, uh, this is Bruno Taut's drawing of what we might call a cosmos. A beautiful rendering. This is... Um, Two books, two books on Corbusier, uh, one on Corbusier's paintings, which is called Plastic Work. And then uh, of the book, the two modular books that he did, which was kind of a takeoff of the golden section. A little background on the drawing on the left is basically you can see that with no color photography, this is in this portfolio of Corbusier, we have some more of these pochois drawings. So this was a black and white photo with the color applied after the fact. Now what happened is Eric Mendelssohn was actually an architect in Berlin, uh, early Berlin, and he ended up living in San Francisco. He was one of my uh, favorite architects when I was going to school. One of the reason is he did these beautiful drawings and especially the drawings when he was uh, when he was in the war and he had a sketchbook and there were these really small drawings and he could do a drawing with just a small sketch and then develop that into a building. This is uh, the book, the English book, uh, first English book on Eric Mendelssohn done by Wittick. And this is the house he did for the heir to Levi Strauss, the beautiful house in Pacific Heights in San Francisco. This book is actually dedicated to Eric Mendelssohn's um, why her daughter's husband and uh, to Mr. Robert Joseph. And this is a drawing that he did of the, what he would like to have seen the University of California campus become. Ooh. And this is discouraging. 
Mm. It works just, uh, fine, but it, it takes a, a second, but it, it's totally okay. We can follow along. No worries. <laughs> okay, I'm yes. sorry. It's a little, it's a little disjointed. Not at all. Okay. Well, this next book, this next book, uh, hopefully it's coming up. Um, I grew up, I grew up uh, in Idaho, as I mentioned before, and I used to read the New York Times when I was in, um, let's say, I think I was in the seventh grade. The Times would come in and it was always a week late. But one of the artists that was practicing at that time and becoming very famous was Jackson Pollock. So when I found this book on his last, this is his last sketchbook, which is a, uh, a facsimile copy of, the, of his last sketchbook. And it was done on uh, like a Japanese sketchbook with a hand sewn in the back. And um, there's a photograph of him with his automobile. And then there's a, a brief about what the sketchbook was about. And then this fits into a beautiful container and then it fits into a cloth sewn, uh, a cloth cover. One of the things, one of the things that happens in publishing is that sometimes the dust jacket of the book becomes as important as the book itself. Uh, no, maybe not as important, but more valuable. A good, a good example of that is Frank Lloyd Wright's drawing book that he, it was called Drawings, and he has this beautiful cover on it. Uh, the cover alone is, is, probably, is, is worth more than the, the book itself. So when you get a copy of it in the cover, the dust jacket is on it, it's, it's really a, a find. This is a book I collected early on Duchamp. It was one of the, it was one of the first books I found where there was a translation of his notes on the project of the large glass. It's a large portfolio book. The problem with the book is, is that they did color imaging on plastic. So what happens is plastic is a terrible material over years when it's so thin. So what you can see is all, all, all the edges of it, basically, I have to tape to keep it all together. And the, the, the dust jacket becomes an integral part of the book. So my copy of this book is just filled with, uh, with different types of tapes that are uh, putting it together. Let's see where we're at here. Okay, <laughs> this is like uh, this is like 1922 in terms of putting this presentation together. Uh, I I found a book years ago. It was called uh, uh, "Flights Over Iran," and it's really an interesting book. It's a series of maps of Iran, and then photographic uh, photographic mylars over those maps showing how Iran had been, had been destructed by archaeologists and also the buildings being very badly taken care of. And it's just a beautifully made book. The, the interesting thing to me is that this is the photo, this, this is the, this is the airplane that was used. It was a de Havilland airplane and it was flown by a lady the wife of Mr. Smith, who was the person putting all this together for the University of Chicago. We have a, we, we think maybe this was financed by the CIA because no one was actually doing work over in Iran at that time. It's a, and it's an extremely beautiful example of how to document uh, buildings that have been torn down or changed. And when you put over the drawings over the what is there now, it is just a marvelous way to study. And the photographs are very, very interesting. Let's see here. Okay, we're here. Oh. <laughs> this then uh, is a book called Map Mapping Spaces by James Terrell. So we know we know the work of James Terrell, but how did James Terrell get so excited about studying ephemeral atmospheres and so on? Well, he liked to fly, and this is his this is his airplane, and he used this to document a lot of his 
projects, especially like the create the create the crater. And this kind of shows some of his examples of how he uh, of how he used the airplane in different manners. Uh oh, okay, here we go. A lot of a lot of uh, uh, in developing a library, some books are actually very inexpensive and some became, become very expensive. This is one of the more inexpensive books that I've ever bought. And it's on the Italian designer, Corradino di Ascanio. Ascanio. Now he, he studied uh, aerodynamics and he invented the Vespa as we know it. Uh, this is, the, the photograph on the right hand side is his idea of the of, of a motorcycle with a Vespa cover on it. So it became a, a racing car in Italy. And uh, he also did um, uh, different studies for different kinds of, of industrial products. One, one of my one of my books I didn't finish was a book on William B. Stout. There's no relation to me. The reason I bring up this particular person is that he, he was one of the great industrial designers of the 30s and 40s. And we're now, we're now hearing about automobiles that can become helicopters and, and so on. And, and in the 20s and 30s, William B. Stout, you can see here in the photograph, he actually designed uh, a machine that could go on the highway, it could fly, and it could also be a boat. And uh, he developed it himself, but he could never market it and it never really went very far. He also was a great uh, designer of airplanes. Now, he invented the, art, the airplane that we know as the Ford trimotor. It used to be called the Stout trimotor. And uh, as you can see, he wasn't, uh, he wasn't too good with money. He loved to invent and he did fairly well, but he, he didn't really care about money. So in, in uh, Dearborn, Michigan, where he had his office or factory, it was on a Ford airport. And so Ford decided to buy the company and changed all of the names of his products to Ford. And uh, he, he then did many other things, but he kind of, he, uh, he wasn't too uh, successful after that. Now, the Ford Trimotor, what was interesting is it's used a lot for smoke jumpings in the Northwest because it had three motors and it could go very slow and it could go over a fire and the smoke jumpers could jump out and be very safe. The, the idea of the metal airplane wasn't anything that was, uh, that was fresh in William B. Stout's uh, uh, inventory, but because they were also doing, this was a French model of the airplane, uh, of, a, of a single engine airplane in France. This is a model, or this is a photograph of a B-29. My father was an Air Force pilot and flew the B-29s and flew a lot of, of different kind of airplanes in the Air Force. Uh, let's see where we're at. Okay, here we go. One of the one of the um, renderings I like, and one of the books I have is um, on Hugh Ferris. And Hugh Ferris was a great delineator that did a lot of delineation in in New York City. And this is a uh, a drawing of his National Airport in Washington D.C. with a DC three. Uh, this is. Two of the other types of uh, inventions that William B. Stout did, this was a Pullman car he did for Pullman that was just a single, tra uh, a single car used to go from small uh, towns in the Midwest. Pullman used, uh, never did develop the car. It just kind of went stagnant. These are some of the cars that William B. Stout actually developed. And you can see the, the drawings, which are really good. He developed these cars about the same time that Bucky, Feller, Bucky Fuller did his car. But Ford's had four, four uh, 
tires on it where um, for, uh, Bucky Fuller's only had three. And so Bucky Fuller's oftentimes fell, uh, you, turned over. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to stop with this photograph. It's it's really um, a cave dwelling in Greece, and then this is Frank Lloyd Wright's last or first building, which was a windmill for his aunt. I want to say thank you for letting me do this talk, and I'm sorry it was so slow, but uh, I want to wish you all the best in your course this year. And if you and make sure you do. Uh, you have a sketchbook and you document everything that you do because it'll be important 20 years down the line. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Bill. It was an amazing um, presentation. Thank you for walking us through the history. It was so meaningful, every single slide. And um, thank you again. Um, I would like to open the floor to our residents to ask their questions. Um, I, um, I see a question posted in the chat, so we might begin there. <clears throat> this is from James McRobert, and he asks, for all of us aging architects with our book collections, what can we do to pass the collections along? Are there outlets for our older architectural books? Okay, that, that's a good question. Uh, I have a lot of, I have two very large libraries, okay? One, uh, one on art, on art monographs of, uh, of artists and also one on architecture, one on history and theory and one on monographs. I had the same question. Uh, I had the same problem. What do you do with your libraries? Uh, I've been very lucky this last year I have endowed my collection to an institute, um, the Eames Institute, which is an extension of uh, the Eames family. And they're going to take my books and, and, and uh, use it as a study center along with their industrial design books. Uh, they have a great collection. It's going to be basically an institute to study design. And uh, at the present time, they have two William Turnbull buildings that uh, barn type buildings in Petaluma that they uh, that they own and they have a ranch there and then they uh, also have uh, uh, a large space next to my library in Richmond, California. There, there are not too many options for you for out of print books you can try to trade for them. Uh, if they're really rare you could probably try to sell them. Libraries libraries become very eclectic. I have one of the things I'd like to share with you is that this lecture became very disjointed because I <laughs> wasn't very focused. One of the interesting and most important books you can read on collecting uh, is done by Walter Benjamin. It's in his book called Illumination. And Walter Benjamin has a whole chapter in unpacking his library and the importance of collecting and also um, great, great thoughts about why you have why why physical books are so important to us. One of the things he brings up in 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 his um, talk or his writing is that where you buy the book, who it's from, the province of the book, uh, it all has special meaning. Uh, so I don't have really. I don't know what to actually tell you about that question, other than the fact that there is a market for out of print books. We have an out of print section. We do quite well with it. Uh, I'll have to admit that the books are quite expensive because some of them are very rare. Uh, you, you should, if you can collect at the time the books come out, uh, you do have a problem because a lot of them go out of print. So a lot of the books, like even some of uh, several of the books on Steve's is out of print. We we helped Steve when we did the we redid the uh, phenomenology book uh, questions of perception, and uh, we reprinted that. And it's been out of print for five or six years, and it's very hard to find those. So um, keeping the library together is is pretty difficult. And I don't know. You probably try to sell them or you could probably find an institution which would take them. I feel very lucky for myself. 
Bill, that was a fantastic talk, very inspiring. And <laughs> I just reached over in this library, which is open to all these fellows of the T-Space, whenever the COVID thing breaks, you can all come here and use this library. And I just, I remember, I just remember something about this Turnbull book. You have this fantastic Turnbull book, but do you remember this house that he did in Aptos? Oh the yes, the one on the beach. Yeah, so here's this house is this big white wooden square with this strange wooden with green tar paper roof, you know, that butts up against it like the waves. And it's a bit, it's so clear in the plan and it was such a geometric, uh, I don't know, just a pure geometric by William Turnbull that I, I that's where I wanted to work. I came down from Seattle to San Francisco in fact, I went to see that house in, in about 1973 on the beach at Aptos. And I went, I went to work. I said, I want to work for the best architects in San Francisco. And that was w William Turnbull, Charles Moore, W. what was it called? MLTW. MLTW, yeah. And I had my portfolio and I went there, but I didn't, uh, I didn't allow for the fact that they weren't hiring. <laughs> I never got a job. <laughs> But that house influenced me, you know, I, I just think that the, he had this sort of clarity of 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 thought. And, and you know, I mean, it was a it was a time when postmodernism was taking things over. And but Turnbull, he's, he had this severe geometric clarity in, in many of those houses. And I was really happy to get this book that Bill published because and for me, it's very important. You get the house, you get the story, but you get an axonometric the sections and the plans. So you can understand, if you wanna study something, you can understand it. And that's what's wrong with today because on, you know, Arch Daily or Dezine, you can just see images and then you don't, you can't study it really. And it just kind of flies by. You don't understand the plan in the section. I think, I think that's, uh, I think books will never die because the internet is dead every day. You know, it just spins by, you know, and then, well, and what happens, what happens when all your information is on a program that you haven't paid for and in 25 years, you can't open it? Right. <laughs> I, have that, I have that problem now. It's a, right. it's a, I think what you need is a combination of information on your computer. And then even if even at this point, even if it's a small library, something that really have, you have a tactile piece of uh, a book in front of you. It's really amazing. I wanted to show you one thing. I, I wish I would. I wish I was there. This is this is Robert Venturi's All right. Complexity and Contradiction in Architecture. First edition. Can you see can you see the notes? Wow. Wow. So whose book was that? This is one of my old students that ended up going to Berkeley. Look and and I think look at look at these notes. Amazing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He's know. arguing with the book. Yeah, she's she's. It, it's just an amazing. It's an amazing piece. Uh, she um, she was a really great student, and I uh, really she gave me this book as a kind of a a memento. One of the things in in um, one of the things in the Turnbull book, there's a beautiful house that he did there for a doctor, and uh, the doctor had four daughters. And Turnbull made a presentation. And accordingly, the doctor said he didn't have too much money, but he wanted to be uh, he wanted to be democratic about it. So he he told Bill, he said, well, I'm not going to make all the decisions on this house. And my daughters, my daughters are the ones who's going to approve it or not. So in the book, he talks about that and he talks about the youngest daughter coming up and says, I think we can approve this, but I don't like to go upstairs because the the uh, bill came up with an idea. Bill was great at stairs and great with circulation. And so the doctor didn't have too much money. And so Bill came up with the idea of bunks. And so this lady said, uh, I don't particularly care for the idea of bunks, but we'll approve the plan. And Bill had a nice uh, quote in there <laughs> talking about having to work with uh, 
work with young children. Now, what happened is that particular ch child became one of my students at the California College of the Arts, and she married an architect, and she's uh, uh, her her thesis problem was the architecture of air. <laughs> so <laughs> I thought that was really interesting. She didn't do architecture, but she did marry an architect, and her son's an architect, and she uh, kept the house for years. They still have the house at Sea Ranch, so it's an amazing problem. I, I would just say, I mean, I mean, these students here probably don't realize it, but the the idea of an architecture bookstore is a cultural project, and that's what Wittenborn had in New York. And I, I when I left San Francisco after working in Bill's bookstore, I was the first one, by the way, to work in the bookstore. Yeah, Steve was my first, we were sharing an apartment, and Steve was my first uh, employee. You and it was only paid, open on Saturday. In, you got paid in lunches and dinner. <laughs> <laughs> we had a cigar box. And then if we got a, sold a few books, we went to Little Joe's and had dinner. <laughs> but when, yeah. I, when I left San Francisco and came to New York on New Year's Eve, 1977, one of the first places I went to the following week was Wittenborn, uh, Wittenborn on Madison Avenue. And I went in there and I was browsing around and there was James Sterling looking, looking through the stacks. So, I mean, that's one of the things about a bookstore, an architectural bookstore, is it became a, a kind of a clearinghouse, a kind of a meeting point. And that's what we had with, the, with, with Bill's bookstore. So it's really, I mean, now there's two bookstores left. There's Wittenborn's gone. There's no architectural bookstore in New York at all. There's nothing. You, you know, you can go to, I don't know where you go, you, you know, and uh, there's two left. There's Bill's bookstore in San Francisco and, and there's Peter Miller books in Seattle. And uh, they're, they, they keep holding the flame of the cultural place. So I'm looking forward to being out in Bill's at the end of this month and then going up to see Peter the week afterwards. Yeah. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, we're, we're still rolling. I've, um, I, I've collected graphics over the years, so in the basement of the bookstore, I have a gallery of, uh, of interesting graphics that I've collected over the years. Um, one of Steve's drawings for his winning competition in Berlin, and um, two or three of wonderful drawings of Lebius Woods, and um, uh, several so Ando. So kind of the gallery down there. It's a gallery now, yeah. So if you come to San Francisco, you can go to the gallery and it's in the wow, bottom. Wow, I look forward to see it. Yeah, it's quite nice. It's um, you know, there's a new gallery at 83 Grand Street that used to be that used to be John Nichols' print shop, and John John, you know, when when things got hot in New York, he closed it and rented the space to a to a gallery, a kind of you know a sort of commercial gallery, many many years, and then a, two years ago they left. And Owen Nichols, John's son, has just opened, you know, the last year and a half. And I was just down there on Saturday night to see the Anthony Ames uh, ex exhibition. Yeah, they just opened. Paintings, yeah. This, it's this, interesting, this. Steve, because the drawing we have in the basement was done by Nichols for you. Uh, yeah. He's, yeah, the, you know, in the in the basement of the, the 83 grand, the his son moved in all those extra prints. So oh, really? the, all those ones that they did for Tom Maine and for me, Palazzo del Cinema, Berlin, oh, yes. they're in drawers downstairs at 83 Grand Street. It's kind of interesting that Owen Nichols decided to come back and, you know, restart the, the idea of an architectural space. I think it's really great for New York. I hope it's really good. Yeah. yeah. I, I saw that also, and I wish I could get back there. And I think the first one was on a French architect, wasn't it? Uh, Drawings of uh, uh, Perrant, Perrant, yeah, yeah. Claude Perrant, that was a great yeah. Show. I saw that too. Anyway, yeah, everybody, all these uh, these young young people should definitely go to eighty three Grand Street when you get a chance. The opening was fantastic. Todd and Billy were there. You know, like people I haven't seen in years. Uh, it was it was a great moment Saturday that's night. That's nice. That's nice. That's what uh, that's what happens with those kind of galleries, and it's uh, but we, we're kind of at a loss. Yeah. But we used to have book signings in your bookshop and in Peter Miller's bookshop. They were events too, right? I mean, yeah. And then one of the one of the main things, and one of the things Steve and I used to see all the time, and not and were really jealous, is 
all of the events that happened at the Institute for Architecture in New York that Peter right. Eisen and all those people started. They did these, they did the same thing that you're doing almost in Rhinebeck when they had summer courses, total courses, and they did these interesting graphics done by Massimo Vignelli. And uh, it was pretty enticing. Uh, you would go back there just to just to go to their space, just to see what was happening. Right here behind me, I have a whole collection of oppositions, you know? Yeah. So yeah. It, when you come here, I have a rare book section. You can see there's, a, oops, it didn't work. Anyway, there's all of the oppositions and all books on Le Corbusier. And I'm, I'm, my idea is to open this up as, as a place that you can, you know, with by appointment, you can come and visit and use it as a study space. Well, that's there good. Are well. a couple of, yeah, they, there are a couple of questions in the chat, maybe, and in the Q&A, maybe Teresa can take that on. Yeah, sure. I see a related question from Ashley, and she asks, you mentioned that you do not operate as a publisher anymore, and that you published your last book five years ago. Why? As an architect who now works as an editor, I'm optimistic that publishing will remain important to architects and the field. Do you think print publishing will be sustained? I think that uh, printed books are as popular now as they've ever been. Uh, there just aren't any bookstores. The problem, the problem we have is that the Europeans, uh, the, the Dutch, Germans, French, and English have a an agreement with Amazon where they can't discount books for one or two years. So that allows the bookstores to actually have uh, a, an edge where right now it's like you're competing against this big company that basically wholesales books. So, but the quality of the books, the quality of the books and the amount of books coming out, I think is, is, very, uh, is very good at this point in time. Uh, I'm quite excited about some of the books uh, I see now the um, I, I did this small talk just to give you a little idea about my book collection and some things I like, but uh, I could do I could do a, a wonderful lecture on 30 or 40 new books that have come out that are just amazing. Um, and a, so there is there is a market there that the United States doesn't have that many good architectural or art publishing companies. Most of the companies are in Europe or in Japan. Uh, Portugal now has a really good set of, of, of a really good series of books coming out. Spain uh, and Italy. The United States has never been really supportive of the arts in the way a lot of other countries are. And I think we, we feel that a lot. So that's really why I started the bookstore was to bring in some of the great publishers from other countries and share those. It, it has been a problem that a lot of the books done on some of the architects aren't translated and I would try to carry them anyway, uh, just because it was the information about the particular architect. Uh, but I can't say that there are too many people or too many publishers in the United, in the United States I would suggest working for. <laughs> said so, you know one of steve and i have a great friend lars mueller he's a publisher out of switzerland and um, i first met lars in frankfurt maybe in 1985 or so and he was just starting and um, he's a, he's a really interesting man i would i would say um, i think steve would also say this that he's a real book man he really he's a designer and he's also a publisher and uh, he's still publishing maybe 15, 20 books a year, which is a I, really, really interesting dilemma. I was just there. I, I was just in, in Zurich and I slept on his floor on, <laughs> on a futon. <laughs> That's great. And he's very dedicated. He just keeps, he's got about 10 people working in his publishing house. And he, yeah, he's putting 15 to 20 titles out a year, completely dedicated to his work. Amazing. Yeah. Uh, Zurich, Zurich itself has uh, another couple bookstores and publishers that are very good. Uh, there's a company called Park Books, and then one I can't pronounce very well, Spies and Spiegelderger or something like that, but it's a really great publishing house. And um, 
Uh, they also have bookstores. When I first started, the first city I went to was Zurich because they had uh, uh, a lot of Corbusier's work were coming out of a, uh, a publishing company there. And uh, also Corbusier's uh, gallery, Heidi Weber was in Zurich. So Zurich oh, we were, I was just there with, with Lars. They, re, they restored it. It's that's fantastic. what I hear. Yeah, yeah that's what I hear. It's a fantastic building. Anybody that goes to Zurich, it's a public, you know, gallery it's now public, it's in the public uh public park and it was a building uh, of prefabricated uh parts that they put together and i think it was financed by heidi weber heidi weber made quite a bit of money on uh did uh corbusier's lithographs and did very well with it and did great shows and zurich is a great uh a, a great city Well, let's say thank you. Thank you very much. I, I'm sorry this didn't go too smoothly. And uh, it went very well. It was great. <laughs> it went very well. Bill, would you have a few more moments for to answer a few more questions from the audience? Can we try? Yes. Teresa, you want to take that on? Sure. Related to that, I also see a question from Luke that asks, Bill, thank you so much for your talk. In New York, we no longer have a dedicated bookstore for architecture or design. If we were to think about making one, what would you recommend to make it viable if not successful? Uh, get a rich, get a rich donor. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they are actually, they actually are out there. Uh, it takes, it takes um, quite a bit of commitment uh, not, not, uh, the, the problem is really space. The, the problem we deal with is, uh, the rents, uh, in New York have always been very expensive. So New York used to have a, a bookstore called Urban Center, which was, should still be there because it was sponsored by, I think the Architectural League and they should be doing that type of thing. Um, uh, but it just takes a real commitment to buying and you have to be uh, uh, out there and looking all the time. And there, there's, the material is there. The problem, you, you are dealing with the problem of, uh, of discounting. So we don't discount books in our bookstore, which is a disadvantage to us, but we feel that once you come in uh, and the books are there, we potentially can make the sale. It's kind of tough on students, I realize that, but it's also uh, the only way we've been able to sustain ourselves over the years. If, uh, uh, and we also, that one of the reasons we're still alive is that we have a wonderful building owner and they've been very supportive of us and uh, they like us being in the building and we have a wonderful location. So, uh, but the, the, it's been amazing just to stay alive during COVID because COVID has been very difficult to keep businesses going. And um, if we, we also, I realized um, when I started the bookstore with Steve is that there wasn't a big enough audience in San Francisco to make it work. So I've always done a catalog. I learned that from, uh, from, Wittenborn. We always used to get a catalog once a month from George Wittenborn of his low, of his latest collections, and they were always very graphically, beautifully done, and they always fit into an envelope. So he didn't ever send anything that wasn't in an envelope. So when you got it, it wasn't beat up by the mail or anything. And it were these beautifully designed bibliotes, uh, bibliopolis or <laughs> bibliographic uh, information about the books that are available, and. Uh, then a lot of some of my first collection was from, from books from uh, uh, George Wittenborn. And I, I opened one up the other day that I bought from him. It was the first book brought into America on, on uh, the, the Beckers. The, the, it's actually called the Beschers are their name, but they're the German photographers that documented all the, uh, the documented industrial buildings and became very famous photographers. And, um, uh, so I bought that book in 19, I think 71. And uh, it's also signed by the, the Besher, Mrs. Besher. But uh, I, I think it just takes a, a commitment to doing it and uh, starting out small and not trying to do more than you can and it'll grow by itself. 
and don't expect to make too much money. <laughs> Thank you. Related to that, uh, Chris asked another question. Hi, Bill. Thanks for the inspiring talk. What are your thoughts of the ongoing relevance of print books for architecture and art books? Are you seeing a strong interest? I'm hopeful for architecture it continues. Can books like Jill Stoner's make it? Um, they, they can. Uh, the, the, interest, the interesting thing is um, there, you know, there's there there is a market for document for books, and I think art books are really important as well as architecture books. Uh, you're just the problem is they're just a limited market, so you can't do large enough runs to really make it work too well. And there've been too many people with the with the advent of the computer, it's too easy to do monographs or books in-house and so there's a lot of books out there that shouldn't be published uh, there are some publishing houses that basically don't work other than the architect pays for the book to get a, a book so they can get work but there's no uh, there's no real critical edge to it in other words they usually don't they do the writing themselves oftentimes they, the photography isn't too good uh, so the good publishers are are still working, but there's a lot of them have been um, conglomerated. So there, there's a lot of the publishers are part of big companies now. This distribution is also done by big companies. There's only two or three distributors uh, that are really doing this now. Uh, I used to get all of my books directly from Europe, and uh, I haven't been able to do that for a few years because it's just uh, uh, a lot of it, it's just uh, it's too com it just too complicated. I used to have I used to buy every book that the Milanese publisher did uh, Lecta on architecture and and uh, I can't do that anymore. And it's the the issue is is that distributing in Italy is done by companies. So companies when you buy books from from let's say Lecta, you usually buy from a distributor. And then it takes a lot of energy to get that material here. Uh, and there is a wonderful distributor out of Amsterdam called Idea Books, and they bring in a lot of the books that I would normally have gotten directly. But um, I, I don't know. I think the art, I think the quality of the of the good art and architecture books are as high today as ever. Uh, Steve just, Steve and I just uh, uh, real. The, the, the drawings of uh, Louis Kahn were just reproduced uh, in, a, in a set that was originally done by Saul Werman, and it was done in a large format book, and they just reproduced that, and it's a beautiful reproduction, and it has an intro to the drawings, too. So, And it's fairly, in, it's $100, but it's fairly, that's a fairly, very good price for that quality of book. Um, it's hard to even find a paperback anymore under $35, $40, so that's... That's the level of where we're at. Thank you. Maybe one last question is also from Luke. Can you talk about the beginnings of pamphlet architecture? Sure. Well, pamphlet architecture was, you, you saw that little show that I did of Steve's, the, uh, the show in my bookstore on Osgood. Well, Steve was at that time doing these beautiful pencil drawings. But those pencil drawings really took a lot of time. <laughs> and he had all of these beautiful drawings. And that one photograph or the one photograph of the drawing of Steve's was on the bridge. And he decided to do these pamphlet architects. Well, you you said architecture. I mean, to be clear, I, I said, Bill, if I print <laughs> this, would you buy, would you buy them and, and distribute them in the bookstore? And we do it as a joint venture. And 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 the pamphlet number one was on the Bronx Gymnasium Bridge. It was called Bridges. Yes. And printed a hundred copies, but you you paid for it, remember? And then you well, what? Yeah, I what I would. Yeah, um, they were done. Steve had an office in an old factory building, and um, there was a print shop downstairs. A, a little guy that could do this stuff, and he would just go Lynch down type. and have these things made, and. Um, my idea is I would I could give Steve some money in advance so he could pay for the printing, 
and then I would sell them. And um, that worked fairly well. Uh, uh, usually we ran out of them fairly quickly and Steve would go down and have that guy print another 50 or so. But uh, we we then for the first 10, I worked with Steve for the first 10 and I would then usually give them a certain amount of money and then they would, oh, I, I, that would be in for for the, the pamphlets. Uh, some of the pamphlets were a little difficult to deal with. It's uh, uh, Some of them were very precious. It's like, uh, uh, Zaha's pamphlet is uh, so complicated <laughs> that, you know, it's the, and then uh, we did one on uh, on uh, drawings that was done on vellum by uh, uh, li Lips. Uh, Livio Dimitrio, Livio Dimitrio. Yeah, Livio Dimitrio had his students draw all these beautiful buildings, but they were done on, on really thin. Bible paper, paper, yeah. Bible paper, yeah. And that Bible, and they were like a, 50 drawings in here and you open it up and the first thing that happens is you've damaged them, but they were absolutely beautiful. Uh, and, then, Steve, and then after the 10th one, Kevin Lippert took it over, took over at Princeton Architectural Books and he never wanted to stop it, you know? Yeah. You know, we're, you know we, I spoke at a memorial for Kevin last week, but Kevin, I, every time, you know, Ken Frampton says, oh, why don't you just end it, you know, at that number or something. And no, no, because there were other people who wanted to do a pamphlet. So we would have a pamphlet call and then we would do another one. So we're we're up to number 37 and we're going to have an exhibition that opens on the 4th of September here about four young unknown architects that we selected as a, as a call to do a new pamphlet number 37. And the, that what's really interesting is what the mission was always about the unknown and the individual architects. So we're kind of carrying that spirit on. And I don't think that's happening anywhere else. So we, we keep it going in some way, you know, and I think, you know, we're going to dedicate that exhibition to Kevin Lippert because he was the one as a publisher, you know, he, he put out these volumes one, one to 10 and 10 to, to 20. Yeah. And the one to ten is really hard to find. The and uh, they, they are they're really the the volume themselves are really well done. He was really an important he was an important publisher when he um, when he was starting. He was it was uh, Princeton Architectural Press, and he did uh, I don't know maybe four or five hundred books. But these so volumes, when, you come, when you come to this library, you can see all of this stuff because there's one to ten, there's eleven to twenty. And they're all collected in here, and yeah, they're, it's really a, it's really a nice collection. Um, it also has lab woods and uh, it, right. it was, and then Steve did several, and Steve also did an exhibition uh, in one of the galleries in New York and had a uh, uh, for the pamphlets, and it was called "Everybody Did a Chair." This this pamphlet of Zaha's in 1981 was the first time that her work was ever collected in a single publication. Yeah, and it's really beautiful. It also has a folding, some fold ups. It's uh, hard to find one that's clean. I have, I have about four. Yeah, they're nice. The well, winner of Pamphlet Architecture 37, Kathy Danzang, she will deliver a lecture for the residency program on the 17th. Oh, great. So I put the information in the chat how to uh, to join us then. Oh, good, Excellent. thank you. That's great, that's great. Excellent. Thank you, Irene. Thank you so much, uh, Bill and Stephen, for walking us through your memories. Uh, this is beautiful history, thank you. And uh, thank you, Bill, again, for the meaningful and inspiring lecture today and uh, for staying a little longer to answer the uh, questions we had. We really appreciate it. Thank you. I wish it would have gone smoother. I was a little nervous. It was perfect. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> thank you for great. having me and have a okay. great summer. Thank, thank you, you, everyone. Bye. Our bye. lecture, bye, bye Stephen. Our lecture bye bye. for your thank information. You. Bye bye. Thank you. Just um, a brief um, um, comment about the lecture we have. Uh, the coming lecture, the image as emblem and narrative by Elia Zangelis. Please make sure you do not miss that. This is gonna be on Friday, July 15th at 11 a.m. New York time. And uh, please find the link in the chat to RSVP. Thank you so much, everyone. We look forward to see you at T-Space.
Take care and have a great day.